This is the New England Journal of Medicine COVID-19 update for January 11th, 2023. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the Journal, and I'm talking with Eric Rubin, Editor-in-Chief, and Lindsay Baden, Deputy Editor. Eric and Lindsay, there's a lot happening around the world in terms of COVID these days. And before we get to a couple of items that we've published, I want to talk about some of these news items. Let's start with China, a country that's performed a sort of nationwide experiment with very strict lockdown for a couple of years that was then suddenly lifted. What do we know about what's happening now? Steve, most of what we know comes in the form of rumors. That's because it seems that the official figures haven't been very reliable, and the country moved rapidly from intensive testing to almost no testing at all. So it's difficult to get real numbers. But I'm quite concerned about the outcomes and a possible large-scale human tragedy. The vaccination rate appears to be low in some vulnerable populations. And the only evidence we've had up to now suggests that the vaccine that's most commonly used in China is less effective than those that are being used in the U.S. and Europe. Since there's very limited pre-existing immunity, particularly outside the big cities like Beijing and Shanghai, there are a large number of people at risk of developing serious disease. I've heard rumors that suggest that both Beijing and Shanghai have seen huge surges in infections since the guidelines changed, so many that the pool of uninfected individuals is shrinking very rapidly. At the same time, vaccination rates in these cities have been better than in some rural areas. Unfortunately, we don't know what that means yet because severe disease lags behind the onset of infection. So to the extent that we hear anything, we might not get a sense of how much serious disease and death there is out there until there are leaks about hospital occupancies. Steve and Eric, I think what we're witnessing is how different communities have responded to control of SARS-CoV-2 and its spread. As we look at the response over the last three years, countries like China have excelled at their ability to lock down and test to block transmission, while other parts of the world, like the U.S., have been quite clumsy in our approach to blocking transmission through community spread, even with our lockdowns, which were not nearly as effective as what went on in China. However, in the U.S. and other parts of the world, we've rolled out vaccination in ways that have dramatically augmented community immunity well ahead of massive transmission. And it's not clear that China has taken advantage of these technologies to provide immunity broadly to its community. So in the U.S., for example, we've seen inadequate control measures through blocking transmission, but incredibly accelerated vaccine deployment to create background immunity. And China, we now are witnessing unleashing of countrywide transmission in a very small amount of time after three years of minimal transmission. So I think we have much to learn in our future public health response from these types of strategies and how they could potentially be combined, where one could have an approach that blocks transmission rigorously while an effective countermeasure can be developed and deployed before widespread transmission occurs. So I do hope that as we see this tragedy unfold, as we have in much of the world over the last three years and now in China over the next few months, we can collectively learn how to respond to these kinds of events a little bit better. I think there's also another important point that we're going to learn a bit about, and that has to do with the virulence of these new variants. Because there's been some discussion that the new variants may be attenuated in the severity of illness that they can cause. And in parts of the world where transmission has gone on substantially over the last two to three years, plus vaccination, leading to high levels of hybrid community immunity, I think it's been difficult to discern if the new viral variants are less pathogenic or disease-causing, or if background immunity attenuates the severity of illness. Sadly, what we may learn in the next two to three months in China is how severe illness may be with these new variants in naive populations. So I think, Steve, there is much we will learn. There will be much sadness, but hopefully we can figure out better ways to move forward as we understand how different public health measures behave and can potentially be combined. You know, I'd go back to the way you phrased the question originally, Steve, where you used the word experiment, because this is really releasing viruses in a population that has limited pre-existing immunity. 
it's important to point out that it's kind of historical because these populations don't really exist anywhere else in the world and they won't exist in China pretty soon. So after there is an outbreak of COVID, after it circulates widely in China in the way that it has in other countries, I think there'll be more homogeneity and SARS-CoV-2 is going to have to spread in a background of relatively high levels of pre-existing immunity, just as it does in most countries. I also think that this should remind us of how interconnected we are. When there's explosive viral replication and transmission in one part of the world, it affects the rest of the world. And with widespread transmission outside of China, that continued to threaten importation into China, and now the converse. And with large numbers of individuals, millions to hundreds of millions to a billion individuals being infected in a short period of time, what the implications are to the global burden of virus that can spread and to the viral evolution that may occur in that amount of replication has implications globally. And so I do hope we don't forget that we are all interconnected and that human health and transmissible infectious diseases anywhere has implications everywhere. So control measures and deployment of therapies should be thought about globally and not just locally. So getting back to that issue of variants, for much of the outbreak, we've seen single dominant strains of virus circulating in a given place at a given time. But more recently, it seems as though there's been much more viral diversity out in the wild. So what's changed? Well, I think what's changed is us. So many of us are immune through infection, vaccination, or some combination of the two, that in order for a variant to successfully transmit, it has to replicate well in immune hosts. This has led to the selection of a number of different variants whose uniting characteristic is that they're not particularly well neutralized by antibodies raised to prior circulating strains or vaccine constructs. Different localities are seeing different mixes of variants. In Boston, for example, XBB15 is now the predominant strain, but there are many other variants that are dominating elsewhere. The bad news is that these variants are relatively poorly neutralized by serum derived from people who've been vaccinated and or previously infected. On a somewhat more positive note, while there certainly has been an increase in COVID-related hospital admissions recently, this seems to be driven largely by the increase in the number of total cases in the community rather than worsened disease caused by XBB and these other variants. However, this is really still anecdotal rather than systematic data. Eric, I'd like to highlight two important points implicit in your comments. One is we need to better understand who's hospitalized because of COVID or hospitalized with COVID when there's heavy community transmission going on. And in many, if not most individuals, and that's speculation on my part, it may be asymptomatic, but there is no way for us to measure asymptomatic transmission because there's no reason to test those individuals At least in the clinic, I have seen many of my patients be COVID positive without any symptoms when routine screening was done, peri-procedure, or for other activities from a hospital infection control prevention standpoint. So I think there's a lot that we're going to have to pay attention there, particularly as data emerge, sorting out hospitalized with or from COVID. A second very important point, and Steve, implicit in your question, is how we think about variants and emerging variants. And the virus evolution is not random, or I don't believe it's random. Or should I say it's random, but then through selective pressure, which features of viral evolution give it an advantage, allows that new variant to emerge and dominate and spread widely. And so new variants have to have some advantage in relation to transmissibility, to replication speed, to immune evasion, which you've alluded to, Eric, with the XBB variants. So I do suspect that it's not going to be random and evenly distributed across communities with different variants, but always new variants will emerge, and those which have advantages will then dominate and spread widely which I think XBB is doing as an example of some degree of immune evasion, allowing it to be successful in communities with high levels of hybrid immunity. So I don't believe, Steve, that we're going to have a smorgasbord of viruses across the world equally represented 
but rather new variants will emerge that have a selective advantage and will then dominate. Hopefully, they will have less virulence in terms of disease severity, but that remains to be seen. And what does the arrival of these new strains mean for vaccination? The story is somewhat complicated, particularly when it comes to the newer bivalent vaccines. Remember that the hope for these vaccines was that they would produce broader immunity, particularly against strains related to the Omicron lineage, which includes all of the currently circulating viruses. We published a study a month ago that showed that a single bivalent booster performed better than two monovalent boosters in eliciting antibodies that cross-neutralized a variety of variants, including XBB. That was a small study. It only included 12 patients. Today, however, we published a study from a different group that compared participants who received three or four doses of monovalent vaccines or three doses of the monovalent and one of the bivalent vaccine. This was a much larger study with hundreds to thousands of people in each group. They didn't study XBB, but they did look at a number of other Omicron variants and some animal viruses. In general, the levels of neutralizing antibodies were similar in those who received four vaccine doses, no matter which vaccine they received. So we have two somewhat discrepant pieces of data here, a small study that suggests that bivalent vaccine is better, and a larger study that suggests that it's about equivalent. What do we do with these differing results? I'd keep a couple of things in mind. First, there are a lot of different assays used in different labs, and they might not be directly comparable. And the populations are certainly different. Everyone received vaccines and boosters at different times, something that might have a substantial impact on antibody titers. But the most important factor is that we don't know how well these levels will correlate against protection, particularly against severe disease. So I think that whether the new vaccines are any better remains an open question. So Eric, I think that it's really important for us to think a bit about what better means. And we've discussed this before. Is better less infection, less mild illness, less severe illness death, less transmissibility? And how do we measure better? Or is it levels of immunologic parameters? These are all interlinked features, but they're very different parameters when we use them to say this is a better vaccine or this is better protection. And we've discussed this before as well, the issue of compartment. Systemic illness is different than transient mucosal infection. And transient mucosal infection can lead to robust viral amplification and transmission, and perhaps very little, if any, illness. So that we need to understand how different compartments behave in different types of immunity, be it natural infection or vaccine elicited. And then the last point that I want to highlight from your comments, Eric, is thinking about what immunologic parameters we're using to make the claim this is better whether it's a better vaccine or you're better protected than somebody else. And the temptation is to use neutralizing antibody and neutralizing antibody directly against the circulating strain of interest. This has strong intellectual rationale and a fair amount of biologic rationale as to why that is true. But the converse is not necessarily untrue. The immune response is quite complex and diverse for very important evolutionary reasons. There are antibodies that don't neutralize a given strain as well that may be active. They're blocking antibodies. There are T-cell responses. There are NK and other cellular responses. So I think our understanding of protection needs to be more sophisticated. And what we wind up talking about, using an old adage, is what we can see under the lamppost rather than what's really going on in the street. I do believe that having higher neutralizing antibodies against a strain of interest is a good thing. I'm just not convinced that that is the sum total of the immunologic protection. I think all of that is fair, Lindsay. And I want to emphasize that even taking the most pessimistic view, the newer vaccines still work, at least as well as the older vaccines, as measured by antibody levels. And so it's still true that being vaccinated and boosted is better than not being vaccinated and boosted with whatever vaccine you have. And Eric, I do want to highlight what I believe is most relevant, which is hospitalization and severe illness. And in our communities here in the Northeast in Boston, there is high level of community transmission 
utilizing wastewater and other parameters for assessing viral burden. Yet the number of patients we have admitted because of COVID is quite small. And those who are admitted to the hospital typically have a risk factor such as a weakened immune system from cancer care or other types of immunomodulatory interventions. So I think the vaccines and the background immunity have made an incredible difference in the severity of illness, but we still have much work to do on transmissibility and mild illness. So you've covered a lot of ground. What does all this mean for future clinical research into new vaccines for COVID-19? I think that many of the points that we have been discussing are going to be very relevant for new vaccines in the future, certainly for their clinical testing, because it is a much different landscape than when we were developing vaccines in the first place. First off, the population that's going to be receiving vaccines in any clinical trial is very heterogeneous. Many of them will have been infected and they'll have received vaccines at various time points along the way, and they may have received different vaccines. So I think it's going to require some cleverness in designing these trials in order to see readouts. But I also think that Lindsay's last point on severity of disease is very important. What we really care about is avoiding hospitalization and death. And these are relatively uncommon endpoints nowadays. There just aren't that many people hospitalized with COVID. And the majority of those who are, as Lindsay pointed out, actually are hospitalized for some other reason and incidentally found to have COVID. So COVID isn't driving those issues anymore. And it's going to be very difficult to see if we can improve on things. Now, I'm sounding very negative here. It would be great to have something better to reduce infection rates, for example. But what we've got already is doing an awfully good job. While there is a lot more circulating virus out there right now, there just isn't so much severe disease. So, Steve, I think that a couple of important perspectives bubble up for me. One, as Eric and I have both already said, the current vaccines and population immunity have dramatically transformed the threat of COVID compared to three years ago and two years ago and even a year ago. I think things that we've learned and can look forward to are the speed with which these platforms can be manipulated scientifically so that we can have new vaccines in weeks to a couple of months instead of a year. I think that technology and that versatility of that technology holds incredible promise for how vaccines can be developed for important diseases proportionate to the speed with which that virus or that pathogen is spreading. I think number two is really understanding a correlate of protection. What is it that we want a vaccine to do to bring out immunologic protection against the outcome we care about, let's say severe illness or even mild illness? And that then allows very rapid iteration to optimize products. So I think that type of work will be incredibly helpful will be difficult with new variants because new variants by definition are new, but hopefully we'll understand the biology of SARS-CoV-2 well enough that small changes in the spike protein do not change its fundamental biology. Therefore, we can iterate with biologic surrogate markers. And lastly, Steve, which I think is really the most important, is we as a community, a nation, have to really decide what we prioritize and what the urgency is associated with these different infections. And I would extend it to more than SARS-CoV-2. RSV, influenza, respiratory viruses that spread rapidly. How do we think about these technologies and vaccines in those arenas to develop them in a way that is truly beneficial to the health of the public? And I think there's so much opportunity to bring these technologies and what we've learned to develop vaccines and relevant countermeasures for diseases which affect millions of us every year. So I'm quite optimistic, but we still have to really make sure we understand what our goal is so that we can develop the technologies to appropriately improve health that has value to our larger community. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Eric.